Welcome, Seamus McDaniel, and thank you for joining us on this episode of Richmond Sessions 2223. Richmond Sessions 2223 features a recording studio space within the exhibition Storied Strings, the Guitar in American Art, organized by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and that's, of course, we're sitting effectively in a closed-off studio within the mm -hmm. exhibition. This exhibition includes about 125 works of art and 35 good guitars, all of these divided into 17 themes ranging from politics, gender, and blindness to race and ethnicity. Linking these themes is the premise that the guitar as a visual motif has long enabled artists and their human subjects to tell stories that otherwise could go untold or undertold. And this aspect of the exhibition, Richmond Sessions 2223, in turn, is a showcase for contemporary musicians like yourself, Seamus, to record songs that demonstrate the power of the guitar as a means for telling stories, invoking universal themes, and weighing in on myriad events. So Seamus, what is your take on this? Can the guitar communicate and express uh, as something in its own right. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think the guitar is a very, very unique instrument. Um, and aside from being polyphonic, you know, meaning that we can play multiple notes at the same time or having a really wide range of notes available to us, um, <clears throat> there's two main things that uh, I think really set the guitar apart from something, say, like a piano. Mm -hmm. The first uh, is that we have access to you know, so many types of articulations and ways to express uh, the notes that we play, the pitches that, that you know, we, we play and love. And this includes things like, uh, you know, palm muting, glissando, slurs, pizzicato, timbre changes, uh, especially on acoustic instruments, um, and many, many more bends. You know, you've, you've kind of heard about this from some of the other uh, players on the Richmond Sessions, but um, the other thing, then this is kind of like my own theory, uh, I, I think that the guitar, and especially the classical guitar, uses uh, a frequency range that is pretty similar to, you know, the human voice. So wow. I, I think okay. that, you know, we can relate to the melodies that we hear, you know, or the, the bass notes resonate in a specific part of our, our body, and, and sure. we can kind of understand it almost like a language, you know? Right. And this is something that I think the guitar is, it, you know, kind of has a, a, a special or unique feature on. Great. Yeah, that makes com complete sense. Can you play us a um, composition or two that helps make this point? Yeah, yeah, I'll play um, a piece titled An Andante. Mm -hmm. An Andante, or Andante is just a, a, a tempo marking, basically. It means at a walking pace. And this is by the composer Justin Holland, who I'll, I'll say a little bit about after I play this piece. Yes. That's great. So 
Justin Holland is a very important composer. Yeah, he is. And, and you want to tell us a little bit about what makes him Im Im important and what we get from this piece in per particular? Yeah, so I think, uh, first and foremost, he was born in 1819 and uh, passed away in 1887. And, you know, around this time, it was very, very difficult for um, black Americans. And Justin Holland was kind of at the forefront for, you know, not only uh, as a black classical guitarist, but classical guitar in America as a whole. You know, uh, classical guitar or guitar kind of originated in Spain and Europe and such, but uh, Justin Holland is very responsible for bringing it, uh, the, the specific instrument to kind of like the limelight or, you know, exposing people to the, the possibilities of classical guitar. And um, he did this by arranging, you know, many popular uh, songs at the time in America. Um, and an arrangement is when you take, you know, like a, a, a song that's usually sung or maybe a little melody played by, a, you know, a chamber group or an orchestra and you put it all on one instrument or in this case, the classical guitar, like I said, polyphonic, right? Um, and outside of, you know, his plethora of arrangements and original compositions, which uh, you can still find online, you know, for free because they're uh, over 100 years old at this point, but he is responsible for creating two important guitar methods or classical guitar methods. Um, and uh, the first one was the Modern Method for Guitar, which he published in 1874. And then he followed up with uh, the Comprehensive Method for the Guitar in 1876. Wow. So... How renowned was he in his own li lifetime? I, I think he, you know, took his uh, prowess on the guitar, classical guitar, and, you know, his ability to perform and compose and arrange and use that kind of as a stepping stone for, you know, how they saw black Americans in general mm -hmm. or musicians, you know. Um, and I think he really put out the first method books that, you know, method books are very, very important, and we have many of them by uh, Dionisio Aguado, um, Fernando Sor, you know, uh, Francisco Tarraga, and they include everything about the left and right hand technique that we need to know. And uh, they may include, you know, excerpts or pieces and little etudes, things like that. Um, and I, I went through some of uh, Holland's uh, method books, and they're very, very comprehensive. They have everything, you know, really nice descriptions, uh, pieces that exemplify everything about the technique and, you know, what you should kind of be getting out of that. But that's a very difficult thing to do. I mean, you really have to take your time and discuss the little motions that we use and, sure. and maybe, uh, you know, talk about the um, ergonomics and, you know, uh, classical guitar is very concerned with uh, preserving our energy and our physiology, you know, it's, it's very important for an, our anatomy, you know, to avoid injury and things like that. And um, the fact that Justin Holland was able to publish those two, those two method books, as well as all of his arrangements, you know, I'm sure, you know, gained a lot of attraction for the classical guitar. Absolutely. In, you know, early American times. He sounds like a wildly important fig figure. Certainly. And just to mention this piece, like I said, it's yes. an andante. It sounds, to me, you know, I, I couldn't really find any descriptions, and that's kind of the case with a lot of these old sheet music or books from, you know, times where they're out of print, out of publish. You can find them in the, like, the Creative Commons online for free. Um, this piece feels triumphant to me, kind of like it, we have a section towards the end where we have a key change to a minor key. Yes. But even though we have that, you know, minor key change, it still feels like, there's, there's a lifting up point from there. Yeah, there seemed to be some A minor and D, D minor in there towards, yeah. the, towards mm -hmm. the end. Definitely. Um, so what, what about you, Seamus? Can you tell us a little, little bit about your journey, how long you've been playing, and, mm -hmm. uh, and where all this has led, led you to now? Yeah, so I started playing guitar um, definitely over a decade ago. Okay. <laughs> yes. I should have thought about the exact number, but um, 
you know, I was in elementary school. Uh, I started out on a nylon style guitar. I think I was still using a pick. You know, the nylon strings are a little easier for uh, kids' fingers and things like that, sure. especially with chords or, you know, even just individual notes. But um, I think after doing a couple years of that, I, you know, I was really interested in an electric guitar. I had an MP3 player at the time. This is like, I think around when the iPods were getting pretty popular. Yes. And I, I had like an off-brand MP3 player and I had a couple albums on there that I think were pretty uh, important for, for me as a musician. Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, oh, Paranoid awesome. by Black Sabbath, and wow. Master of Puppets by Metallica. And so I was listening to those three albums on repeat, basically. <laughs> That's amazing. And uh, that kind of, you know, my parents were into that type of music, so obviously the, the influence kind of came down from them. But Guitar Hero as well. Sure. Uh, a video game came out around that time where you kind of got the, the general articulations. And yeah. I already played guitar, so I had some kind of experience there. Um, and after that, uh, you know, I, I focused mainly on electric guitar for a while. Uh, my teacher up in Northern Virginia was a shred guitarist, so uh, he took me through the ringer with rhythms, you know, 16th notes, yeah. uh, patterns, things like that. Uh, and in high school, uh, in Loudoun County, where I'm from, they have an amazing and incredible faculty of uh, classical guitarists. That's wonderful. So if you wanted to, you know, take guitar, you were taking classical guitar, which you know, like we just talked about, it's important for the ergonomics and uh, for playing efficiently. And, you know, that transcends all guitar playing. Right. Classical guitar. So you're, you're talking about t timing. Mm -hmm. right? And I thought about, about that and the rhythm uh, yeah. of what you were, the Andante piece you were just playing. Could you play us a piece in either 6-8 or 3-4? Three, three, yeah. So this next piece um, is a bar carole which is like a boat song um, in, you know, generally those are in six, eight. Yeah, you get the sway of one and uh, two, or one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Yeah. Um, and you'll feel that throughout this piece, but there's also a lot of, uh, you know, liberties taken with rhythm here and there. Um, but the, the subtitle to this piece is Bounding Billows by William Foden. Okay.
That's great. F sharp has never sounded so ex expressive. Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, you probably saw the bar chords that I had to hold. For. I, I was just, I was just saying, putting your pinky on that fifth fret while you're barring that. Yeah. Yeah. Hitting that A, I guess it is, mm -hmm. is uh, whoo, <laughs> yeah. it's quite a literal stretch. Yeah, it's necessary though, right? It's part yeah. of the melody. And is that the, that's not the biggest hand stretch you make on the fingerboard though. No, uh, usually the, the one to five stretch Ooh. is a pretty big one, right? The F to the, to the right. A there. Instead of the F sharp to the A, you get that yeah. one, you know, that one fret back. Um, there are even, I, there's a Bach piece that, uh, I don't play a lot of Bach because I don't like playing arrangements. I like playing pieces that were composed and written for, for the guitar itself. But, um, I know there's a Bach piece where you have to hit a B and F sharp, I believe it is. Well, that's just nuts. And you use your thumb on the top of the. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> I've done it on electric guitar. It's a little easier because the frets are smaller, right? The right. Scale length is, is shorter, I was going to tell people, you know, watching this, just to be a master of the obvious, that as that would be easier on the thinner guitar neck of a strat. Yeah, certainly. Of, of a strat or a tele. And I'm sure, you know, on the piano or the, you know, the clavichord or the keyboard, no problem, right? But right. <laughs> That's why that's why I kind of stray away from from those things and you know I, I really like highlighting what the guitar is capable of and I, arrangements are a way of doing that but I think uh, original compositions that were you know utilize the instrument in some way or another really bring out specific characteristics and not to mention they're probably a little bit easier to play or fit in the hand a little bit better right so how do you think that piece evoked the idea of bounding billows yeah i mean and what exactly does that mean to be honest i'm not sure i i took it as you know and again some of the, you can't really read like you can't watch an interview with the composer right uh, uh or, or read a, a little excerpt there may be one thing here or there but this is kind of in a collection of of songs and um to me uh you know it starts out like there's rough waters, there's rough seas, right? And this could be a metaphor for anything, right? Um, right. We start in that, that F sharp minor, right? That big F sharp minor chord. Um, and again, it starts pretty slow. There's, there's little fermatas here and there, you know, some, some tempo ramps. Um, and then we get this nice middle section where we're in kind of in a major realm, right? We're, we're kind of out of the, the minor thing. Yeah. And then we come back to it at the end. Sure. And, you know, I think aside from taking it literally as like the boat going through rough, rough seas, you know, you get to the, you get through to the, the middle of the ocean and it's all calm. And then you, right. you know, on your way in, maybe it's thunderstorming. Um, this could be a metaphor for, for, you know, anything in life. Just, just like the first piece, you know, kind of like a overcoming of, of, you know, some, some hardship. Do we know much about w William F Foden? Uh, yeah, so I, I have a couple things uh, written down here about him. He was born in 1860, passed away in 1947, so um, a little more recent, right? And uh, he lived a long life for, for that time, I believe. He, um, he, he started music, playing music on the violin and switched to classical guitar at age 16. And uh, I thought this was pretty interesting because uh, the renowned violinist Paganini actually wrote played and composed on, on classical guitar. Yeah. And his pieces are, you know, about as what you'd expect, pretty, pretty fast, pretty crazy. You know, he was a virtuoso violinist. And um, from what I understand, he was a little private with his classical guitar playing. He didn't really, Paganini didn't really perform it much, but I thought that was kind of an interesting parallel to, to William Foden, who, right. um, you know, also started on the violin and trained yeah. and, liked the classical guitar so much, had that first point of contact, uh, so that he, you know, eventually transitioned to playing classical guitar and yeah. writing some amazing pieces. Again, I, I believe Foden also did arrangements and uh, a lot of dances, like polkas, waltzes, um, uh, mazurkas, things like that. Um, and one last thing about him, uh, he had a run of, of uh, signature guitars in 1911 to 1917 with Martin called the Foden Special. 
Hmm. Um, classical guitars, they, you know, I think uh, early guitars had a bit more of like a, a smaller body. You can actually see some here in the exhibition. They have smaller bodies right there. They're a little more thin. But I think they made those guitars for his students. Um, and yeah, they were called the Foden, the Foden Specials. And you can find That's a lot about them online. Sure. There's, a, there's a brochure that states um, every guitar inspected by Foden. I love now, that. I don't know if that's true or not, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of those early Martin sales brochures and catalogs have survived and, uh, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's amazing. I got a lot of in information in this exhibition and the accompanying catalog book from way back Fen Fender, Martin Gibbs, Gibson wow, catalogs yeah. like that. Yeah. That's great. So how do you pronounce the name? I don't know. If, I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong. Charles De Janin? De Janin? I believe it's De Hanon. Thank you. I, I think that makes a little more sense. He he uh, was born in Colombia, okay, and uh, emigrated to New York um, at six years old. So I guess this was in 1940. Or sorry, 1840. Uh, he was born right. in 1834. Died in 1911. The same year that they made those. They started making those Foden specials. Um, right. Just so you see, there's, there's some overlap with, with these three composers so far. Um, and yeah, this next piece is called The Addy Waltz. And again, I couldn't find a whole lot of information. You, you know, a waltz is a dance, obviously, in 3-4. There's a specific tempo marking for, for waltzes around like 85 to 95 BPM. Um, you don't want to be waltzing too fast or too slow, right? right. Then it would be something different. But... Um, Addie might be like a nickname for a, a woman, maybe that he had a thing for, and maybe that can that that will come out in the music and the composition. Are you going to take us through a few different keys here? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, there, there's again uh, like the, the a similar modulation, but um, yeah, a couple different keys, and you know it begins and ends with uh, this the same A section. Okay, so. Bye. 
That's outstanding. Thank you so so much. You are really swimming and out of keys. You got E yeah. minor, G, I think C, I think D, and you go back to E, e, e minor. Yeah. E E E major. E minor. E minor. E minor. E, e minor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, you know that's pretty difficult on guitar. We have a set of keys that we really like using um, sure. before we start to lose our open strings. Right. And whenever that happens, we start barring. <laughs> right. So, you know, the, the first one uh, that kind of goes is G, you know, in the key of yeah. A and E major, um, and then D, you know, so on and so forth. But these chords are all very related to one another. I mean, relatively mm -hmm. speaking. I, yeah, I, think, I think a preference for keys is also, I mean, uh, so much of Bowie, David Bowie's mm -hmm. in G, A, D. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes you're limited by what you can kind of uh, sing, right? But if you find the right way to, you know, uh, kind of work around that, you know, right. you, can, you can find so many interesting things. And I think one thing that we're really losing in modern music is key changes. And it, they yeah. sound a little jarring when you do hear them sometimes, but um, I think that's only because we don't hear them in like modern pop music. There are some examples. I was just yeah. recently listening to Surrender by Cheap Trick, mm -hmm. which goes from B flat to B to C. Yeah. And they use that to make, I mean, the, the song is just like B, F sharp, E, B. I mean, it's not exactly rocket science, but it has this kind of, you know, kind of jars you into another realm each time it goes up a half step. Yeah, and you know, I think the beauty about key changes on the guitar, like I said, you, you start adding bar chords, but even around that, uh, we have a limited range. We have that low E, right? This, this is the lowest note yeah. that we can play. So, you know, maybe that's yeah. our fourth, maybe that's our fifth, maybe that's our third. Well, you say that, but you're about to play an electric guitar that <laughs> goes from goes a little F bit sharp further. To... Yeah, yeah. There's, I, I, I would like to see more key changes in like modern music. And there's, in, in the examples that I, I'll play later, there's a couple small things, but it's usually just pulling from a different mode or for a very, you know, split moment. Seamus, how difficult is it to stop what you're doing and play harmonics? Oh, yeah. In the middle of this. <laughs> yeah. is, that, is that technically uh, a difficult thing? So I mean, harmonics are not that hard, but to play that in the, to play in, the those, in the midst of everything. Yeah. yeah, and the next piece that I'm going to play actually has artificial harmonics, so, you know, we can... Of course. We yeah, can change then, our, our, you know, right. the, our 12th fret by effectively putting a capo wherever our fingers are at. Right. Um, but Is yeah, that the it, Andrew York? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a little difficult, um, and especially that, I think, uh, that ninth fret harmonic. You can also get it yeah. at the fourth, right? Right. But the brighter you get with your right hand, you know, the more, we have more uh, tension on the string close to the, the nut and the bridge, which is why that F major chord is so difficult to play. Um, but if you come back a little bit, you can hit them very clearly. You're obviously putting your left hand right on top of the fret that you want the harmonic. Yeah. From. But what about your right hand? Where for good guitarists, uh, classical and more pop and rock styles, where is it best to have your right hand when you do a harmonic? Or does yeah. it ma matter? So, yeah, I, I'll, I can demonstrate a little bit too. You know, we can get... It seems just there's, there's kind of a sweet spot, right? Like right around here, and about I two inches to your right from the sound hole. Yeah, yeah, from the sound hole, from the bridge, and generally you're going to be playing away from the sound hole because that's where the sound comes. You know, if if you want to get warm and quiet, you you kind of put your hand up here where right. there's less tension, right? Is this true for all playing, or just for certain matter of in instruments? Yeah, it's a lot more, uh, you know, obvious on classical guitar, I think. Would this apply to a dreadnought? Yeah, certainly. It's, it's a little less, you know, you kind of have like a natural compression on the, on, the <laughs> on the sound of steel strings because they're very bright and they emit, you know, a lot of high range frequencies sure. naturally, whereas classical guitar is a little bit more warm. And so we have to compensate by, by getting a little brighter. 
Yeah. And you know, one interesting thing too is that uh, you not only have harmonics on this side, but you also have them on this side of the string. Yeah. So if you can find the spot where this harmonic and this harmonic are kind of lining up, yeah, that's you're gonna get the clearest you know harmonic you, you could hope for. <laughs> So Andrew York, and I only know this because you told me, he's a James Madison University grad yeah. graduate, mm -hmm. part of the LA Guitar Quartet, yeah, at the forefront of modern guitar comp composition. This should sound wow. fam familiar. Yeah, I, that sounds verbatim. <laughs> from what that's I, what you told yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And yeah, I I love Andrew York's stuff. I I think he really inspired like the past couple decades of classical guitar composers mm -hmm. and a lot of finger style guitarists as well, you know, on, on steel string acoustic. Hmm. Um, he has several albums with original compositions. On some of them, he plays electric guitar and, and steel string acoustic, but it's more just classical style on those instruments. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I've played a, a a lot of his compositions before his uh, beauty of equations suite um, jubilance and uh, sunburst and uh, all some some really amazing and incredible compositions that really take I think they include aspects of the guitar that you know are are special to the right. instrument and especially in composition and things right. like that and this piece into dark is part of a three-piece suite it does actually have like a little excerpt at the end that tells you um, how to play it. And maybe I'll say that after I play it sure. so, that, so that you kind of, you know, whoever's listening or you, you can get your own uh, interpretation of the sure. piece. You know, I don't want to influence things. But um, yeah, he's still alive today. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of seeing him in, at Wolf Trap several wow. years ago um, with a couple other finger style guitarists. And yeah, he was part of the LAGQ from... Uh, 1986 to 2006. What's the LAG? LA the Los Angeles Guitar, Guitar Qu Quartet. Quartet. Yeah, yeah, and he, one of my favorite compositions that he played with them was a, a, a tune called Passage. So whoever, whoever's listening should go check that out. Passage. Okay. But this is Into Dark? Into Dark, yeah. And okay. I mean, you, you can get some inference from the title, but sure. I think the piece will, will also inspire a little gotcha. bit. Gotcha. Very, very nice. Those are, I guess, false harmonics? Yeah, we call them artificial harmonics. Okay. You'll see them noted as RH, right hand harmonics. Right. And again, you know, it just takes advantage of that 
that 12th fret harmonic, and if we put our first finger down on the first fret, it moves up to the 13th. Gotcha. Right, and that's how we can get our harmonic on any note. Some of the, even, you know, like a C sharp, which we don't really have a way of playing a harmonic for, yeah. naturally. So you become a human ca capo, essentially. Exactly, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the, the many articulations that classical guitar, and you can do this on other guitars too, but the guitar in general, I guess, uh, kind of has a... a, a, a it's very unique to, to, the, to the guitar. You know, and harmonics in general, I think uh, you can get them on other instruments or you can get overtones, you can get, you know, things like that. But a, a very deliberate and articulated uh, harmonic is something pretty unique for, right. for um, the guitar. Yeah, that, um, of course, those artificial harmonics are at the core of the kind of T tapping yeah uh-huh uh, so many shredding metal players yeah the tapping harmonics and again if you find the right spot right where you're yeah. you're cinching your your physical wavelength of the of the string you can hit some really really nice harmonics that way that piece you were playing has a beautiful i think kind of emerging into light rather than darkness per personally yeah so uh, let me dun, read the little dun, 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 dun. That's stunning. Let me read the little excerpt because you're, you're kind yeah. of spot on. It says, okay. and this is performance notes for, for the whole suite. And okay. for Into Dark, it says, play the melodic line with great beauty and soul. What in your life has moved you from the light into the dark? Uh, what is sweet about it that sustains you? Tell the story. But yeah, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting that um, the melody sounds so kind of serene, right? And it, it goes, it kind of, walks the border between light and dark, I think. And maybe depending on how you play it or your, your life experiences, that may come out in the way that you perform it. And that's yeah. true of any you know, piece that you'll ever play. No one will sure. play the same piece, uh, or the, the, piece uh, the same piece the same way. So you're a good guitar teacher. Mm -hmm. um, do your students typically play nylon string cla classical i'm trying to se segue into the uh yeah yeah so eight string <laughs> eight string eight strings yeah. electric you're gonna play do most uh, of them do any of them show up with you know um electrics yeah les I have, pauls strats all that you know i teach a wide range of of students i have uh you know i think my oldest at one point was 80 years old and okay. then my youngest was six. So uh, all different kinds of instruments and sure. levels too. Um, but yeah, I have, you know, some classical students, some general guitar students, acoustic guitar, some singer songwriter, um, right. electronic music production stuff, uh, a couple bass students, ukulele. And then, um, you know, I have a couple electric guitars too. And the ones that like the electric, they enjoy it a lot. And they, sure. you know, one of my students just picked up an eight string. I think I inspired him a little bit. Uh, for he, His parents got him an eight string for Christmas. And uh, that opens up a whole new world of things to right. talk about and go into. Um, but yeah, it's you know kind of a wide range. And uh, again, I think my core fundamentals and teaching and what I, what I pass down to my students all comes from classical guitar and technique. And you know, if you play the way that you know, like the method books say, you're going to have the easiest time playing. Yeah. And you're not going to wear out your wrists and your fingers, which is a pretty big concern. Sure. Playing guitar, you know, multiple hours a day. So, Seamus, you uh, are going to show us a little bit about playing classical styles on an eight-string <laughs> guitar. And uh, yeah. Let's I will. I will be using a pick, but my fingers are still, uh, you know, moving around. So you're hybrid picking. Yeah. Um, tell us about the first piece you're, you're going to play. Yeah. So uh, both of these songs will be um, released hopefully sometime soon, um, early 2023. Um, I'm hoping by February, or March. These songs have been done, produced, written, composed, recorded, mastered since April of last year. But putting out music is a difficult and daunting task, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, I have everything in place, everything ready to go. 
um, before I put anything out because this has kind of been the culmination of um, everything that I've done so far uh, in terms of workflow and process and uh, composing capabilities. Uh, or I'm still in a band called Retrosphere, which at this point is just a duo with me and another guitarist. Um, I was in a band called Epiphany. We played around Richmond for a couple years. Um, haven't done anything since 2019 or you know December, right before the pandemic happened. Um, but I'm hoping with these songs to be the, the, the first of four EPs amounting to a record called Anatomy. This first EP is called Mind. Um, and the first track on it is a, a song called Highly Myopic, which um, so you could take some symbolism out of it, but it's more so that uh, my eyesight is pretty bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, this is heavily influenced by uh, uh, one of my favorite guitarists and composers, Aaron Marshall, who's in the band Intervals. Um, instrumental stuff across the board, uh, kind of high energy. And this, or what I'll be playing of this track will be the first couple minutes. There is a guest solo um, by an Australian guitarist named Jake Housem Lowe, who does a very similar thing um, towards the latter half of the song. But uh, I'll just be playing from like the intro through verse two. Yes. Today. I'll keep the rest of the song a secret <laughs> okay. for, for everyone to listen on the, on, you know, when, for, yeah. when it officially releases. Great. Wow. Not that I'd expect anything less, but that was fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, so, really, as Metallica-esque as parts of that perhaps were, part of the beauty of a piece like that is that it eradicates somewhat preconceived hierarchies between the genres of music yeah. in the first place. <laughs> I mean, like, what was that? I mean... A lot of individuals might say that was shredding metal yeah. and not classical, per se. 
Mm-hmm. So maybe we shouldn't be so stuck on our archaeological shelves and say, this is rock, this is classic. Yeah, rock. definitely. And, you know, the term that they kind of use is just progressive. <laughs> right. But that could mean anything, right? That right. Could, and there's a lot of bands, I think, uh, right now that, that kind of fit within that progressive realm. Progressive metal, you know, it's, it's more so the, the textures and the instrumentation, right. I think, uh, maybe gives people an, a, a preconceived, uh, you know, idea of what metal is, you know, or this or that. But, yeah. you know, I, the melodies that I use in the verse and, you know, the pre-chorus harm- harmony, the chord progression there, I'm trying to, you know, kind of stretch things a little bit and utilize, you know, uh, catchy melodies, interesting harmonies, uh, yeah. you know, different tempos and divisions of notes, things like that, trying to be lyrical for some sure. sections and, uh, you know, really texture driven for others. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of a wide array of things. And I think when it comes down to it, because, you know, I've been influenced by the bands that I listen to. And again, you know, those, those three albums, that's just kind of my vocabulary. But if I was on, you know, a different instrument, I'd probably be writing very similar things. It's just, I, I guess, the context that sure. uh, the song uses. So much of what we listen to and who we study with, especially, you know, inform who we are when we go into those different directions. Again, remind us, Dark Side of the Moon by Pink, Pink Floyd, Metallica. Yeah, and uh, Black Black Sabbath. Sabbath. Which Black Sabbath album? Paranoid. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And I, I listen to those for months on end i they, you know if those are the only three things on your mp3 player yeah. you're you're just gonna shuffle through them right gotcha gotcha can you tell us a little bit about the instrument you're playing yeah so this is a, a strandberg Bowden. um this is the metal series uh they have a couple different kinds but they're all relatively built the same way um uh, the brand strandberg it's a headless guitar thing weighs less than six pounds which is kind of crazy for an eight string um, with this surfboard of a fretboard <laughs> of a neck. Um, there's a lot going on here. Uh, obviously, like I, like I mentioned, no headstock. We have the multi-scale length. So the scale length or the length of the string from the top string to the bottom string increases greatly. As you can see, it's you know going diagonal out this way and then out this way. And that helps preserve the, the tension on the string uh, as, you, as you progress because the lower the string is, especially if you're playing something like what I play with heavy guitars, distorted, you know, a lot of the, the tone comes from the attack of the pick. And you want those strings to be pretty tense, even if you're down tuning or playing something heavy. And then you want those top strings to still be bendable and light. And we can achieve that on one instrument by using multi-scale. And then the frets just kind of follow in line with that. I think the neutral fret is around like the seventh fret. And then from there and back, they, they fan out a little bit. Is this the first uh, fanning fingerboard that you've played? Yeah. That, that you regularly played? Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah. And, uh, you know, there was not too much of a, uh, a learning curve there. Thankfully, everything just kind of fits into place. And I really appreciate that, because uh, I have a seven-string Music Man Majesty that isn't multi-scale. And that seventh string, I'm always having trouble intonating. Or finding right. the right, you know, sure. string gauge for the for the floating tremolo, things like that. Um, a couple other things too. It's it's chambered. It's got this really nice endurneck um, neck, which is a trapezoidal shape. It's patented by Strandberg, and it basically just allows your thumb to rest at a flat surface uh, up higher when you're on the the lower frets, and then uh, up lower when you're on the higher frets. Gotcha. Um, and again, this you know, is kind of right in line with my classical technique because you never want that thumb chop. I mean, I do it occasionally for for you know stability, but um, if I wanted to or if I was you know looking a little more carefully, that thumb is never on the top or right. on you know it's right where that trapezoid is. It um, occurs to me that the pickups fan too. Yes, yeah, that's very important because, like we talked about with the classical guitar, the tension varies you know from the middle of the string to the outsides right um and you want that pickup to be picking up a, a clearer sound uh where it's not flubby and and moving around as much 
Um, and so they have to fan the pickups as well sure. along with that. And Is these, there anything special we should know about these pickups? Yeah. So these are Fishman Fluence Modern pickups. Yeah. Uh, Fishman uses an, uh, their own technology, which is instead of having the copper wire coiled, you know, like the mm -hmm. old school, it's a, just a piece of circuitry. The sound from one pickup to the next in the manufacturing process is going to sound almost identical. You don't get much variance there. And so you won't get, you know, like a, a dead or a bum pickup gotcha. every once in a while. And um, they're powered. So I use a nine volt battery in the back. You can buy a rechargeable one. And Strandberg did a really nice job of uh, not only chambering the body so it's like, but uh, completely uh, coating the inside and the electronics with uh, frequency resisting, you know, paint and, and things like that. So you don't get mm -hmm. uh, interference. Are you only playing on the bridge pickup right right now? Yeah, yeah. So I, for this song specifically, the leads, um, I felt sounded a little bit better with the bridge. As opposed to with the neck. Yeah. It's a big difference, right? And I think right. just for the way that I was thinking about that, uh, that verse and the leads here in general, I wanted them to come out a little bit sharper. This song to me is one of the more intense ones. It's, like I said, high energy, kind of upbeat, you know, uh, moving fast, swiftly. And to me, that, that bridge pickup kind of brings out sure. that sound. Well, it's really been great ha having you here, Seamus. Can you take, take us out with another original composition? Yeah, yeah. So this, this next one is the last track on my first EP. Um, there's only three songs. This is the third. It's called DLFP. And it's called what? I'm sorry. DLFP. It's an acronym, which I'll leave up to interpretation. <laughs> but uh, this idea, or the main idea of this song, which is the intro and the the verses, uh, has been around. I've been playing it for like three, four years at this point, mm -hmm. and never quite knew what to do with it until I. You know, really sat down, hopped in the studio, and uh, took the time to think about how to evolve this one little idea into a five-minute piece. Right? And that's that's always something that's kind of difficult. But for me, you know, I, I when I compose, I follow a thread, and I play one note, I hear the next. I play one chord, I hear the next, and then you know, you you, you start that way. It's kind of like uh, starting a puzzle, and you don't know what the picture is yet and you're just finding the pieces that kind of fit together. And then as you get more towards the, the edge, right, you, you kind of fill that's, things that's in. That's a great metaphor, yeah. Yeah. And that's the way that I compose. You know, I, it's, I know a lot of people uh, think a little more emotionally, right? They're, they're, they have a feeling, they have a, you know, and for me, it's maybe less of a feeling. You know, obviously there's, there's emotion evol involved and um, I'm not the most like outgoing guy. So I get a lot of my like, you know, emotions out through music, playing heavy music, you know, or this or that. And um, it's just, you know, I just have kind of a different perspective on things. And that may come from playing a lot of classical where you're so alone and isolated, sure. just you and the instrument, right? Yeah. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have uh, my friend Jeremy and Ryan help out with this EP producing and uh, helping me with the drums and um, I probably couldn't have done it without them, but everything is, the ball is rolling on this and, and hopefully this, this EP will be out uh, pretty soon. Well, that or definitely maybe gives even, us something to look forward to. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
That's outstanding. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. Those, um, I guess, your your two lowest strings, which are tuned to A and E, those um, those are monster bass notes. Yeah. <laughs> which coupled with what I assume is a is a bass that you're playing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's um, a bass there, and there is a bit of overlap, right, with that low E yeah. and the A there. And I think it just kind of accentuates it to to a really nice degree. And I tried to, you know, save that those low strings. And later on in the song, there's there's a yeah. riff that does use the the low eight. Um, yeah, when you're doing this. Um, descending bass line mm -hmm. uh, when you go A minor, G, F. You know, it has a lot of similarity with standard rock ploys, but um, mm -hmm. you got a wildly, wildly dynamic range of sounds. And that's really a carryover with your cl classical playing. Um, and, and maybe this is true of all cl classical, but you seem to veer on the Let's have a lot of things going on at one one time side. Yeah, I, I really enjoy music where you know you listen to it once, and then you listen to it again and again and again, and you find something new every single time. And that goes with classical too. You know the little articulations, the inflections. I really love playing pieces that you know just kind of unfold the more you 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 play them and. I always tell this to my students, you know, playing and uh, writing and, and everything in music never, it never gets easier. You know more about it, but the more you know, the less you kind of know. <laughs> it's yeah. a weird dichotomy there, but, um, you know, uh, option paralysis is a thing. And like I said, I sat Say on that, that again, option. option paralysis. So okay. when you know so much that you don't know which direction to go. Right. You know, and that's kind of where we have to rely on our inner voice and what, you know, is, is really speaking to the individual to, you know, drive our compositions. Otherwise, we could plug something into a, you know, an AI generator and we'd have music. But right. I don't think that'll ever happen. I don't think that'll ever be the case. I don't think so case. either. I will tell you, though, as a guitar player myself, I think I have lack of options paralysis <laughs> because I mean breaking out of a major minor pentatonic rut is um and I'm sure you work I with mean, your students on exactly that. Yeah and that whole it's mostly A minor pentatonic but I remember when I wrote the the little lick there I really I really wanted to utilize unison notes. Yeah. Which is a big thing that you know is is almost exclusive to the guitar. You know, the piano you have one key for one note, but on on here, you know, I can play E, you know, six, seven different ways depending on sure. you know, how I play it. And right. um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on, but I I really enjoy packing everything in. And again, you know, when I when I write, when I have that initial idea, there's a million different things available to me and and I have to kind of pick and choose or you know feel out what what is going to work best for the texture and you know in that in that past song I really wanted to uh you know I'm, I'm going all the way up to this high fret and then I immediately go down to that that low A right right I wanted some juxtaposition there it's also in mixed meter it goes between three two bars of three four to two bars of four four but you know I mean really bringing us full cir circle is the fact that there's something very singable, hummable about a lot of what you're doing. Um, yeah. I, I hope this doesn't sound like an insult, but no. you have some real hooks in there. That's, and you know, I... Like human voice. That's like the language that, you know, I speak and that, um, you know, aside from having to include lyrics, you know, I, I kind of speak in the way of melodies and yeah. these ebbs and flows of, sure. you know, notes and textures and... I think the biggest thing in music is always the, the melody. It, you have to have a melody. And I see a lot of, like, you know, if you took away the, the, the vocals of a, of a metal song, 
you'd just be left with riffs and there wouldn't be, you know, a, a whole lot differentiating it from the other, you know, power chord, yeah. you know, bands uh, sure. out there. But I think that even within my harmonies, like, uh, like that, this is what's happening underneath that main idea of the right. song. There's your F sharp, your Dorian. We're just pulling from major. Right. How are you getting that su sustain, that particular type of sustain? It almost sounds like a delay, but it's not, is it? Yeah, I'm using a, a plugin by Neural DSP called Archetype Nolly. Nolly is a okay. producer for uh, the band Periphery, who's another progressive metal band. Um, and it, there's, I think there's reverb and delay on there okay. to some extent. And, uh, you know, we get this kind of naturally on classical guitar with just the resonance of the instrument and, yeah. again, those ringing strings. You know, I play, I play this note and I mute it. You can still kind of hear it. It's a little less obvious on the electric. It would be way more obvious on the classical. But the other strings ring, you know, with right. sympathetic vibrations, sympathetic harmonies. And um, this, you know, in the day and age of noise gating and compression, we kind of have to add that back in, that life back in with reverb and delay and chorus, what have you. Well, thanks so much for, you know, I mean, one of the, the uh, even if you might not put it exactly this way, I mean, I, I, I want to thank, thank you for sharing the consonances, the con congruences be between uh, classical guitar and rock and metal mm -hmm. uh and i want to thank take this opportunity to thank you so much thank you for Seamus having me mcdaniel for for joining us yeah this has been this. an incredible opportunity uh it was really nice walking through the exhibition and uh you know at the end you see the studio and i was like oh man i can't i can't wait to be in there <laughs> well <laughs> and I hope it sounds amazing in here i i had a really good time playing and talking to you and i hope that i enlightened some folks on you know uh maybe the realm of progressive instrumental music i'll call it i won't label it as metal but i, I it's progressive sure <laughs> um well. as well as classical guitar and you know its importance in uh you know american history and, and art well you've you've certainly very el eloquently and clearly gotten that across so i want to thank you again so much for your for your time and efforts here and thank everybody for join joining in today and we'll see you next time thank you